Um, when I came to the University of Akron 21 years ago from the Seattle Police Department, I carried with me a deep concern about the relationship between crime, punishment, and politics. If you read the Akron Beacon Journal every day like I do, and kudos to our fantastic hometown newspaper, then you are, then you've seen the horrifying stories about the uh, heroin epidemic in our community. I want to applaud our local leaders, from social service providers to law enforcement, public and private sector leaders, for making an unusual choice, for choosing to respond to this crime wave with a conversation, with prevention and treatment, empathy and compassion. That is real progress in our ongoing efforts to find more productive ways to think and talk about crime, punishment, and politics. The stories are indeed horrifying. 2014 heroin-related deaths were more than four times greater than cocaine-related deaths at the peak of the crack epidemic. In a September Beacon Journal article, they noted that more people died the month before from heroin than any other month in Cuyahoga County history. Of the 52 deaths, they ranged in age from 20 to 71 years old. 39 were men, 13 were women, 46 white, 6 black. What I find most amazing about that story, however, is that we chose a response that focused on a conversation to help the addicts. In Summit County, 213 heroin deaths in 2015 represents a 50% increase over just one year before. And that's consistent with the best available data at the national level. This past summer, the Beacon Journal ran several stories where they noted heroin shows no heed to race or sex or age. And what used to be thought of as a drug primarily used by the poor was now seeping into Akron's suburbs. Half of those interviewed for those stories indicated their addiction began with an abuse of prescription drugs. Just like heroin in 2016, in the 1980s and 1990s, our communities were devastated by the explosion of the crack epidemic. Then, like now, the news was filled with horrifying stories. We can all remember the frightening images of crack addicts saturating our communication channels. A September 1989 story in the Beacon Journal noted, quote, gorillas are roaming the streets. There were numerous stories about crack babies and their irresponsible mothers. Politicians and candidates ran on promises of zero tolerance. Police chiefs promised more aggressive sweeps, more arrests, and tougher prosecutions under federal law because federal penalties are more severe. And severe they are. In the 1980s and 1990s, our zero tolerance war on drugs targeted crack addicts for arrest and prosecution, resulting in what we now call America's incarceration explosion. Before we chose to launch that war, our incarceration rates had fluctuated between just above or just below about 150 per 100,000 every year from 1925 to 1980. After we chose to wage that war, however, our incarceration rates skyrocketed to levels never before seen in recorded human history, doubling to over 300 by 1991 and to nearly 700 per 100,000 today. As Tupac put it, it ain't a secret, don't conceal the fact. The penitentiary's packed, and it's filled with blacks. It turns out, most drug users are white. Most drug pushers are white. Most arrested for drug offenses are black. A 2015 Brookings Institute study found that in the two decades prior to 2010, 31% of new prison admissions were for drug offenses, more than for violent offenses. And while both black and white are smoking crack tonight, 
Blacks were four times more likely to be arrested and nine times more likely to be incarcerated for drug offenses. What are the costs of choosing a war over an incarcerated, a war over a conversation to the incarcerated, to their families, their communities? Not to mention to taxpayers, building more prisons at the expense of building better schools. The story matters to me because I struggle all the time with how to respond to frequently heard claims that we already know blacks are more criminal and more violent precisely because the penitentiary is packed and it's filled with blacks. This story allows me to see the logical and hurtful fallacy embedded in claims like that. When we chose a war over a conversation, we chose to target their children on the false hope that this might protect our children. When we chose a war over a conversation, we chose to create and accept a conventional wisdom, a way of thinking and talking about crime, punishment, and politics that was then and remains today distorted and harmful. And the harms are not evenly distributed. If today we see the value in a conversation, empathy, and compassion, Let's celebrate that transformation and apply it to all our children.